So I'd like to welcome everybody and say thank you for joining us this morning, or I guess this afternoon, it feels like morning, it's so cold. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for, this is our session number six for construction. And so welcome to everybody. Today we've got um, two great presenters. We have Alan Bean from GeoGrade Constructors, who's gonna be talking about the Port of Seattle bid opportunities or procurement opportunities. And then following him, we've got Kunjin Dial, who is from Innoviz um, LLC. And he is actually gonna be talking to us about government contracting. Wealth of knowledge today, lots of um, information and, and just a lot of um, you know, experience out there. So Alan Bean is gonna be able to go first. So we've got everybody, we've got Lily Keefe, Project Director for United States Department of Transportation, Small Business Transportation Resource Center for the Northwest. Um, Lily covers a five state region and is one of the major sponsors for this event along with the Port of Seattle. So this would not be possible without USDOT, the SBTRC. So go ahead, Lily. I'm glad that we are here. Just wanna say welcome everybody. I think some of you already know who I am, but except I've seen a new face, Murray Edwards. So I'm like from the project director of Northwest Small Business Transportation Resource Center. We are part of USDOT Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization. We provide free technical assistance to all the firms like you guys who wants to do business with USDOT funding recipients like Port of Seattle. And what we do, we have a free technical assistant, free support service, free workshop, everything is free. It's your tax dollar money at work. And then we have Tanya Moda, our consultant, and then um, Jessica Chang. And also um, thank you for our partner PTAC and um, you know Daryl Sander and uh, Marnie. And uh, I think just a little bit, I'm still working on getting you guys free the guidebook, okay? I, I don't forget, I, you guys will receive that. And in the meantime, if your construction companies, I think you already know uh, what we need to do. You guys need to work with us if you need to get bonding and we will provide more support service. Contact us, email us, anything that you guys have, any like burning questions or any challenges, let us know. Maybe we could help or maybe we could direct you to the right person. And without further ado, and then our next presenter, Alan B. Alan. See, Alan, I always have a problem with your last name. <laughs> you know, people try to put more syllables in it. It's just Bean. Yeah. Okay, Bean. Okay. Plain, yeah, yes. just plain, old, plain old Bean. I wish it was fancier because I wouldn't have got teased so much probably as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Here you go, Alan. Take away. All right, no problem. So let's get going here. So yeah, the topic here today is overview of a Port of Seattle bid advertisement and bid item or unit rate bidding and estimating, kind of an overview of those things. And so um, sponsors here, Port of Seattle, Northwest Small Business Transportation Resource Center. And then this is our virtual Port Gen Bonding Education Program. So session objectives for this session will be the, the overview of a Port of Seattle bid advertisement and then an overview to the bidding and estimating process. Then we'll jump into something that's very important, you know, having a formal um, go, no go decision or a bid, no bid decision. Very important to have that, you know, um, process or checklist specific to your business. And then, and, and then we'll start covering the, the office and project overhead allocation for a bid item unit rate bid and the fee and profit considerations for the bid item unit rate bid. And then lastly, we'll get into the parts of the uh, bid item unit rate estimate. And I'll show examples and then the spreadsheet that I'm using for the examples, I can provide that for, to uh, people that, that are interested. So those are the, the um, areas that we're gonna cover. And so let's, let's get started. So before we jump right into a, um, example, Port of Seattle bid advertisement, I just wanna kind of give a little bit of a background to, and this is just very generic, um, you know, across, I mean, this covers not only a Port of Seattle, but a lot of different um, public and private owners in terms of what information they, they put out there as a part of a typical bid advertisement. This is by no means um, um, 
for everything. You know, there's always exceptions to the rule, but this is just a good generic rule of thumb. And so typically what the owner will put out there is um, something called a project manual. And that project manual contains um, a lot of the text, a lot of the writing. And so a lot of people um, think that there's just these technical specifications and plans where there's a lot of meat and a lot of information in what's called the front end documents, which are your general conditions, your general requirements, and then separate from it and not a contract document is like uh, your information to bidders and ITB or request for quotes or something like that. That's a, a totally separate thing that kind of summarizes, you know, things that are unique to that opportunity um, as instructions to the, to the bidders for submitting in the bid. So the, but again, it's a part of the front end documents. Um, the general conditions is typically like in general, that's like the, you know, more of the legal aspects, a lot of legalities contained in there. The general requirements tend to be specific or tailored requirements that the owner has for you to do. Like if they have a special training program for you or any special uh, forms that you have to submit or things like that, that you have to do, that'll typically show up in there. And it's, it's, it's not a bad idea to think of division one, the general requirements, as more or less an extension of the general conditions. But again, these are all front end documents. And a lot of times people will refer to these as the non-technical standards, right? So, and then, and I'm just flowing down from the project manual man into the front end documents. Then sometimes, you know, the owner for whatever reason they have, they may want to modify or put something unique that is not a part of their more general boilerplate, general condition and general requirements. And, th and then they'll release something called a supplementary condition. And, and that can change or modify your division zero, division one, general condition and general requirements. And again, this is just blanket. I'm, I'm trying to keep this so that it's, it'll give you an idea, not only for the Port of Seattle, but just like in general. So, so this is very generic. And so those are things that you have there. So those are the front end documents. And I want to spend a little bit of time there because, you know, I've, I've been a business myself and, and I've been working with uh, a couple of small businesses. And this is something that people tend to overlook. They tend to jump right into the work and then they miss the contractual legal aspects of, of the project that are contained in your division zero and division one. And so I, I'm going to go through this and and kind of encourage people to read through those things and study those things real well because whether you'd be bidding as a general or a prime contractor where you would have the, the contract with the owner or if you're bidding a subs, always a good idea to really go through, you know, your general condition and general requirements because um, the prime contractor, if that's not you, they, they, they flow things down. And so it's always better to know the prime contract know what's involved with it because I always get worried whenever I would see a subcontract that was very short because guaranteed they flowed everything down from the prime contract and may or may not have given it to me. And so there might be some landmines in there. So the, the, the legal and contractual aspects of the uh, project are very important to know. And th that's what you get into with the division zero and division one. And also I like to keep it real where this is also a time where you, you want to engage a construction attorney or, or have access to a construction attorney sometimes to help get you through this because it's a lot of legal legalities and legal information in there that you may or may not be um, familiar with. And then lastly, I like to call everybody's attention to that if you're a contractor, there, you know, the word contract and contract is there for a reason because we have to be experts at contracts. You understand what I mean? Because that's what we negotiate and execute our contracts as contractors. And so you know, always take the opportunity to get through the general conditions and the requirements. So that's the front end documents. Then you have the technical specifications and this typically follows your CSI format, the Construction Specifications Institute format. And they may have increased these by now. I may be a little dated on this graphic, but um, it's typically, it starts from division two and I believe we're out to division 50. I could be off on that. But those are your technical specs. And then um, as a part of the contract documents, you have your drawings, which could be civil, architectural, structural, plumbing, HVAC, whatever the case may be, um, you know, this could change. And then when it comes to the technical specs and the drawings, 
changes could be made to those things as well. And, and again, I'm talking during the bidding process now. I'm just focusing on that. So, you know, during the bidding process, those things can be changed and it will be done via an addenda. And so that'll be a change to the plans and specs. And again, all this stuff would get incorporated into the ultimate contract. So that's why I have this last box here called contract documents that this stuff will flow down into the contract documents and then post bid or after you win the bid, there'll be some other things that you have to do. But this is kind of what I'm funneling down into contract documents. All right. So without any more this uh, discussion on that one, I'm going to go to an example. What I did is I just went to Vendor Connect, um, which is Port of Seattle's um, solicitation website. And I found a project that I thought was a pretty good representation of all the different things that we have here. And I will be pulling up an, an, an active solicitation. So I, I just would mention to you, this is something you're interested in or you're looking at. Um, I'm not the one to ask questions. You want to ask the question to the appropriate people at the Port of Seattle. I'm just bringing this up as just kind of a relevant example to go over today to make it obviously very specific to the Port of Seattle. So, you know, you log into the Vendor Connect and then um, I just search for, let me see if it'll let me go back so you can kind of see where I started from with this. Um, it's not liking me today. All right, I'll just, I'll just keep it here for now. So basically you had these tabs along the top. You got your overview, which gives you the department, the port contact, email and phone number for this particular solicitation. This one we're looking at is the 2021 Airfield Pavement Replacement Project. So we're just going to look to see what, what documents uh, the Port of Seattle has made available for this particular project. So we click on the Documents tab, and we see that they've put drawings, specifications, and a bid package. So there's three documents here. I've downloaded them all. And then something else that's kind of handy on a lot of these online um, solicitation portals is they put a plan holders and bidders list. So you could go through here and look to see who's bidding as a prime, who's bidding as a sub, you know, what kind of certified certification they might have and so forth. And so this is kind of a good way to either, if you're a sub, you can see who the primes are um, and so forth. So this is, this is who, and this changes, this information could change daily. So if you're not registered within here, you won't get any notifications that there's been, you know, changes. But that aside, it's always a good idea. If this, if, if, this, if this is a project that you're actively tracking, it's always a good idea to have a set routine um, to kind of check it on a, you know, on a daily basis or as often as you feel you need to 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 be more proactive and look and look for changes um, to it. And then so that's the overview documents plan holders list. Then I'll click on the events and it looks like there's a couple of events set up for here. There's the bid opening. That means this is currently when um, the Port of Seattle is gonna um, receive all the bids by. That could change. Um, so that's why you wanna check. And then there's a pre-bid meeting set up for, you know, in this case, it's December 14th at, at uh, two o'clock. So, you know, this is just something to where they'll go over the bid advertisements and stuff for this particular job. Looks like it's gonna be um, something that they're doing, dealing with the COVID, so it looks like it'll be a, a video link. So, you know, check back here, they might add or change some of these events. And then there's some event documents, which there's nothing, you know, currently here to uh, look at. So this is just the overview of what the Port of Seattle Vendor Connect looks like for a particular project that, that I just, um, uh, selected. All right. But the way that I got there is you, I just went to the Port of Seattle, the business tab, and then I clicked on view and register for current bid opportunities. And then that'll take me here. And then I just clicked on current and past solicitations. And then that's where I found this um, 2021 airfield replacement project. And the status of it is open. So this is this is an active project. So just real quick, that's how I how I um, got to that point there. So I'll pull this one away, and then I'm going to pull over uh, those documents that I um, 
download it. Get that yanked over here. So this is what that looks like. I'll blow it up. And then I'll ask the question, um, are we able to see this? Are people able to see this pretty good? All righty. Yeah. So there's three documents here. There's a document titled uh, bid package. Then there's another one. Um, let me get back up to the top page real quick. Then there's another one titled project manual division zero through 32. That kind of matches that graphic that we just went over. And then there is the plans, the project plans for this particular project. So those are the, those are the three files that they, that they had there. I downloaded them all. Um, and again, you always wanna re make, sure you, make sure you register if you're planning on looking at this job so that you get updates because they may change that, add some, take some away, you know, whatever the case may be. But uh, this is what they had as of um, a couple hours ago. So let's go back to that bid package. This is typically, you know, like the ITB where, and we're just going to scan through some of this stuff and I'll go through a couple of high points. Um, but again, th this exercise is just to kind of more or less show you where you can go for the Port of Seattle, um, what you can download and what, you know, a typical uh, construction solicit uh, solicitation looks like or advertisement. And I picked this one too because this one match. This one is a, a project that is done on kind of a low bid, and um, it's a, a unit rate or a bid item project. So that's a very common way to do it. It's not like a, a lump sum or something like that. It, it, it's going off of bid items, and that's kind of the aspect of estimating and bidding that that I would like to cover, like us to cover today. So we got the bid package here. Let's kind of scan through that. So very first, this is you know part of the uh, division zero, this kind of gives you, you know, different notices that you'll need as a part of the bid packages that you have to sign and submit as indicated below. So it has a bid form. This job is requiring a bid bond or other bid security. And the, the, the third item is you have to have, you have to list your subcontractors. And then it, it, and you have to be, you know, when I say read this stuff, it says that you have to do it within one hour after published bid submittal time and typically when you miss things like this, they'll deem you what's called non-responsive and your proposal can get rejected. And so that's just one of the, the you know, things that you have to pay attention to when you're looking at this. And then item four is your subcontractor bidding report. And that's the document number that Port of Seattle has assigned to that. And they'll give an example of it here in subsequent pages. Then also this particular um, advertisement has a, a disadvantaged business enterprise proposal form and, and a document number with that, and that has to be submitted with the bid. And then also it has a Buy American and America certification that could affect you on some of your material procurement and the document there, and that has to be submitted. And so this very first page, you know, the word attention, they're, they're, they're giving a lot of weight and, and calling your attention to this. So that's typically the cover that, that they'll give there. And then this jumps right into the um, bid form here where you know you would fill it in, contractor name, date, project number, so on and so forth. And this gives who it's going to and, and, and saying that you carefully reviewed and examined, and examined these documents here, uh, which is the project manual, which we'll look at next. And then the other drawings, and we'll look at that quickly after that, as well as the site of the project and conditions affecting the work. So this is poor Seattle's way of telling you that not only should you look at the, you know, the um, documents there, but also take advantage of the opportunity to go and look at the site itself and, and any conditions affecting the work. So, you know, you have to document that stuff, um, what you've seen to, you know, to be a, a, um, a response, to be a responsive uh, bidder. And it's saying that the undersigned proposes to furnish all labor materials, equipment, superintendents, or field supervision, or office supervision, whatever the case may be, insurance, and other accessories and services necessary to perform and complete all of the work required by and in strict accordance with the above documents and the implied intent thereof for the following schedule of unit prices. And they waste no time getting into the legalese side of things. And so there, there's a lot in that. I mean, that's, there was a lot in there. 
So again, if if that's something you don't have the experience or aren't familiar with, that's that's not a you know a bad conversation to have with a construction attorney or you know a seasoned construction person um, to kind of have them really paint the picture what all goes in that because that's basically saying that once you bid on this thing, um, if it's what the document said or what a reasonable person could have gotten on making a site visit. Okay. Oh, then, 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 then that should have been included in the uh, cost and in your proposal. All right. So that's kind of, and then this is, so what I mean by like the, you know, the bid items and the unit rate is these items, items here. So, and then they call them schedules. So this one right here is the unique item number for this. This is the specification section that these safety provisions for work area S are covered in. So that's specification 01353.13. So it's often good, you know, to make sure you, you, that you have, that you understand that there's references to spec that you have to go look for any information that further describes what the work is for the safety provisions. And then again, this one is a bid quantity of one because it's a lump sum unit. So lump sum units is it's all in. Any unit price that you put in there is all inclusive based on this lump sum for what is described for these safety provisions in this reference spec. And so you'll put that unit price there, then you'll multiply that price by one and that'll give you your amount that you're saying that you can furnish this um, work item for to the client, in this case, Port of Seattle. And the same thing goes for all of these for work items. They'll give, you know, spec section references, they'll give a brief item of work description. They'll put the quantities and the units that they've developed as a part of their design process for this particular project, all right? So that's an example there. And then there's numerous items. Um, notice each, some of them are LF for lineal feet. In this case, you have to have some, some channel drain protection, more of an kind of environmental thing. Here's the spec here. That's the unique item number. It's been estimated that there'll be 1,455 lineal feet of channel drain protection. It'll let you know in this spec and also on the, on the, on the, the um, corresponding drawing or graphic information, what that is, what that looks like, where it goes. And so for here, this is what I wanna get into after we go through this is coming up with the way to um, figure out what your price is per foot which is bid item unit rate price. So you need to have a price per foot such that when you multiply that times your, your quantity, 1,455, you'll get your total bid item price here that you're gonna be submitting to do that work for, all right? So I don't wanna go into too much more detail here. That was just kind of the point of going through this is that for each of these things, you might have EA for each. Again, we got lump sum, SY for square yards, um, CY for cubic yards, and TON for tons. See if there's anything else they're throwing out there. That's where you got square feet for this item here, the airfield pavement marking. That's gonna be covered in 100,000 square feet for this item. So we'll scan through this. And so there's multiple schedules. You got schedule A, schedule B, um, schedule C. And again, these are all just items, items of work that during, during the design process, the owners, either internal staff or consultant has identified that that is included as a part of this work. All right, and so right here, you always get into the, on, on these proposals, items here that kind of clarify about taxes and completions and, and so forth. So for instance here, it's talking about the um, state or local taxes that, that have not been added, uh, completion is saying that the undersigned agrees to substantially complete all of the work included in the contract within 261 calendar days as provided in the general provisions. And then if there's any addenda, this is just showing that you have to acknowledge that, that you uh, received and put that addenda in there. And then also, this is just a bunch of stuff like legal representation. I encourage everybody to read this, bid withdrawal, other documents. So the wage certification, DBE utilization, um, it's also certified you don't have any unpaid tax liability. And so these are all conditions to your bid that have to be satisfied. So you just don't have to fill out how much you're doing it for. You have to also make sure 
that you meet these requirements as well, or that you provided for these requirements to be met in soliciting DBEs and subcontractors and so forth to um, be, a, be a part of this project. Because these are things that if when it gets examined by the owner is has not been done, it, it could potentially um, disqualify you uh, from that particular project. And then so you go through all, all of those things there, you list this here, you put what business entity you are, and then whoever is an authorized official with the company to sign it, you go ahead and you do and you sign it here. All right. So that's an example of the bid um, solicitation with the items. Here's the project man uh, manual. I'm just going to kind of uh, go through to get to the um, index on this one. But on this notice to bidder, this is something I've noticed that, so in regard to diversity and contracting, the port actually has went through and listed some NAICS codes uh, potential to, to look for for potential DBEs to kind of help out. So that's kind of a neat little thing there. And then, um, so this is the notice regarding site inspection, bid clarifications, your labor and industry training requirements and so forth. You want to read through that stuff. And then in general, in this project manual, it lists the, you know, the division zero, which is, you know, the bidding requirements, contract form, condition of the contract, a lot of the legal stuff, um, advertisements, instructions, bid forms, subcontract. So these are all the things that are included in this project manual. And then division one, it's kind of some owner requirements. It'll give a work summary. Um, this job has, this project has what's called a project labor agreement. You're going to want to make sure you check into that. Um, airport, you know, personnel identification to access control. This project is, is, is air size, so there'll be some security provisions that, you're, that you and your staff would have to have. That's where we'll talk about there. Measurement and payment procedure, you know, how you're going to measure and, and then ultimately get paid. These are a lot of the very important things that when I say flow down, one of the important things, if you're operating as, you know, a subcontractor, a general contractor, you want to make sure that you get paid. You know, and because that affects your cash flow and your ability to do business in this section of the of the division one general requirements. That's where they you know talk about that. And then you know, there's a variety of other things here. There, that you have some project coordination you got to do. You know, if there's any other active projects going on, they want to make sure that you coordinate that project meetings. Um, here's the bar chart schedule. Um, we kind of covered that a little bit in the previous presentation, but that's how they want to track you know your progress and pre and so forth. So these are all of the general requirements that you need to be you know, familiar with that go along with the work. And you have to include time and effort to manage and produce these things. So we'll talk about that um, a little bit later. And then now we start to get into the tech specs with division two. They talk about some existing conditions. They have a fuel line demo, site demolition, so on and so forth. So for this one, you got division two, the division three, Division 26, 31, and 32 and 33. So you don't have like every single, you know, division there. This one is very tailored and specific. So, you know, you're going to have some concrete work with the, with the division three, some electrical work with division 26, earthwork with 31. They have some exterior improvements where they're covering the asphalt pavement and some of the other repairs there and some joint sealant and stuff in that division 32. And then 33, there's some utilities. Looks like there's some water distribution, some industrial waste and sanitary sewer going on here, some under drains, uh, and then man manhole and cast basin. And lastly, bef before you know, we leave this, these appendices, always check these because what I try to do when I'm looking at a job is always try to find drawings or information that shows the final product. What does the finished product look like? Um, that kind of gives you a good idea to kind of like visualize what's going on, whether you're the general or the sub. So if you're the general, obviously you want to see that because you have to orchestrate, make sure the whole thing gets done. But as a sub, it's good to see where you fit within the grand scheme of things. You know, wh where are you at within this project? Are you going to be there a month? Are you going to be there a year? Are you going to be there four times or five times? So to, to look when the finished product that you can kind of see how it's phased and how it's going to flow and, and, and get put together, this is a good conversation if you're a sub and you're working with a general, you wanna make sure where you're at on the schedule. How do they have you figured in? Because ultimately, Port of Seattle just cares about who the prime contractor is, right? Because that's who they have a legal relationship with, a contractual relationship with. So um, 
to them and, and actually technically, even though you might be subbing or doing a part of this, um, the prime contractor is responsible for it all. So they're kind of running the show as the prime contractor. So you want to make sure that you know where you fit in there based on their scheduling or planning for this particular job. So it's just a good exercise in general to know what the final product looks like and where you fit. So that's why, you know, as an example, if I'm doing a road or a bridge or a transportation project, I'll look for what's called the striping plan. Actually, I'll do the same thing for like the, the, the airway pavement as well. I'll look for another striping plan because that shows the final condition of how parts and pieces are gonna move around on this airfield. That's kind of gives you a good idea of what the finished product is gonna look like is that's one of the last things you're gonna do is get it marked out with the uh, striping and so forth so that it can serve its, you know, it, its intended use. So in this, in this permit here, what, what, what draws my attention or, or, or gets me interested is this Appendix B, the construction safety and phasing plan. That looks like something I'm probably gonna spend some time looking at, whether I'm the prime or the sub. Because um, definitely this is gonna be air side and it's probably gonna be working while the, the, the uh, airport is active. So the owner is very, obviously very uh, interested to make sure things you know, go safely, but also they don't affect existing business too much. You know, so. If I'm seeing safety and phasing, that's kind of letting me know that that's, that's going to be a pretty good document to spend some time looking at. And in addition to the different environmental permits and stuff like this 402 permit and, and stuff like that, but this right there would be a pretty good place to start just to get a good overview of the project in my, in, in my mind. All right, so plans here, typically you have you know, your cover sheet and then you'll dive into this is the index that you have everything that's in here. You got some general plans with some phasing. You got your civil project plan, standard details, kind of gives you a little more information, pretty standard there. Always good to see what abbreviations, you know, when you're dealing with plan sheets, you don't have a lot of space. So they, engineers and architects tend to use a lot of abbreviations on the plans to, 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 to leave room. Then you got your different symbols and stuff that they use that's unique to this project set. So you can get used to how things are organized graphically and, 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 and shown, all right. Um, this is like a legend here. Here, this gives you a different legend, you know, a line with FW in it, fire water line, so on and so forth. These are things you just get familiar with as you're going through digesting the plans. All right. So that, I mean, that's pretty much the overview that, that, that I like to cover on this piece of it. So I'll get this out of the way and jump back to the rest of the presentation. All right, so next, let's, let's talk about the, uh, what's going on here? Let's, let's just talk about the uh, bidding and estimating, estimating process. So basically estimating is simply just building the job on paper before you build the job under contract, that could be on a computer as well. I'm just, this is just a, a kind of a catchphrase. So you wanna have a good plan to build it because failing to plan is, plan is planning to fail. So there's a lot of prep work that you do as a part of the bidding estimating process that is just, you know, good. Uh, it's, it, it's just a part of the planning process. So you wanna review the scope of work and project requirements in the bidding documents to identify, you know, all your costs, your indirect costs, and also your direct costs for the project. You want to make sure you perform a quantity takeoff to quantify the scope of work. And it's, and it's always a good idea to organize your, your, your takeoff by your cost type. You know, is it labor? Is it material? Equipment? Is it for one of your subcontractors? Or is it something related to your indirects for your office or your project overhead? Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. And, and then use of a form, whether it's electronic or paper, along with marking up your bid documents, whether it's the plans or the specifications, whatever it is. That's also a good practice so that somebody could either come back and check what you did or at a later date, you can come back and review what you did, you know, the previous day to kind of check to see if it, if it still makes sense. All right. Items to look at prior to bidding. These are just some examples. Is this project work you normally do? If you do not do portion of the work, do you have subcontractors to get quotes from? Um, do you have the time or resources to even put the estimate together? Do you have time to see the site and find any hidden issues with the work um, that you would only get from kind of a real laying eyes on it type of, a, of, of an opportunity? And then do you have time to confirm 
the quantities in the uh, bid scope. So that those quantities that the owner gave, do you have reason to believe that they're off by a little bit? Um, do you have time, you know, time to check that out? Is the schedule for doing the work clear and attainable? Can you get it done in the 260 some days, 262 days, I believe? Uh, do you have the insurance, bonding, and the funding, you know, the money in the bank um, to uh, do the project? And is the site easily accessible? If it isn't, what kind of added costs are you going to have to have there to access the site? Um, are there any special requirements on the times the work can be done? Is it nighttime only, daytime only, weekday? Can you work the weekend? What type of support items will you will be needed and allowed on the site? You have to have generators, you know, um, security fencing. Is the project scheduled during a part of the season where adverse weather conditions are likely? If it's in the winter time and you're in a, a cold weather environment, you might have to deal with cold weather concrete if that's in your scope. Is the location in an area that requires workers to have special clearances? Just from our quick overview of this one, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's on the air side of the Port of Seattle. Um, when and how do you get paid? That'll be in, in uh, Division 01. Um, what are the requirements for submitting a partial bill for payment, like uh, materials on hand? Um, do you have to have any special permits? Does a, does a contractor have to provide any special permits? What types of schedules do you need to have and when? They mentioned a bar chart schedule. What are the closeout requirements? What are the things that you have to do in order to get financial close, to get your retainage, to get you, you know, your final payment and, and get relief, get your bonds released from this uh, job? Another quick thing there I like to do is it's always a good idea, I think, to know what the closeout requirements are and as, to the extent you can, close the job as you go. Don't leave a particular work area to go to another one until you've got it all you know, bought off and, and everything done um, and ready to go as you go. It's, you know, if you move past it, by the time you get to the end, might be different people there. You may have, may have forgotten. Not a bad practice to close as you go. Are there other contractors on site during your work? You know, kind of mentioned the project coordination. Um, when we're looking at the Port of Seattle bid advertisement. If so, who has to coordinate it and, and, and you know, and so forth. Uh, will you need utilities on site? You have to have temporary power, um, water. Where will your workers park? Are there liquidated or real damages? Liquidated, they'll typically mention in there, it's so much per day or whatever. Real damages, is, I mean, that's a tough one because that means they could hold you on the hook for any damage associated with your delay of the work. So that airline, if something that you did to keep them from having access to, the, uh, to their facility, they can hit you up for all the lost fares, salaries, whatever. You know, it's, re it's the real damages that they suffered for being delayed by a day or a week. That's a big one. You, you're going to want to think hard if you, can, if you can handle that type of or mitigate that type of a risk. Um, is the owner schedule realistic? Is the, is the 260 some days, is that... Is that really going to happen given market conditions or whatever, or your access to, to capital and resources even? What submittals will be needed and how long is approval time uh, you know, to get the materials once ordered? So you might have like long lead items and stuff like that. So you need to go through those things to make sure that, that you're able to, to deliver. Again, it kind of gets to is the owner schedule realistic. And are there any owner staff that can be a problem, you know, during the project duration? Is there somebody that tends to, to, to not realize that um, things aren't always black and white and, and written out a certain way? You know, there's some things you come up, come across in the field that are unique and you have to try to deal with them on a case by case basis. So that's just something if you're familiar with that project team, you want to account for those things because it could cause delay or cause you to take some extra time um, to get paid or to get approval to get it done. Just some things to consider. So now we'll, we'll get into the next piece, the, the go, no, go, or the bid, no bid decision. So after reviewing the scope of work, the site and any relevant items, you know, prior to proposing the go, no, go, um, you have to say, do you really want to sink time and money into bidding this job? Um, here's another little catchphrase that I like to throw out there is no deal is better than a bad deal. I mean, and, and then to give some examples of that, um, of a, a bad deal is that you submit a bid that is less, you know, this is what you told them you're going to do it for. 
and it's less than what the project will cost the company to do. You know, and, and, and another example is, you know, you, you win a project and then all of a sudden you don't have access to the money to even cover your payroll. So having consistent, well-documented processes, checklists, you know, internal manuals that support the business function of estimating costs accurately is oftentimes a key to like getting that work. And it can help you deal with that, you know, with that first bad deal. If, if you, um, if you had to go through and have somebody cross check or have an independent estimate done to verify those quantities, those are the things that you have to do to make sure that somebody doesn't make a mistake and miss on a big item. So you want to have a consistent process so that when somebody is doing a cost estimate for you, it's not everybody doing the way, doing it the way they think they should. They're doing it in accordance with a well thought out process and checklist. Um, also, you know, using estimating software that kind of ties to your company financial or your company's, you know, access to capital, your bank accounts or whatever, as kind of an all encompassing solution that you use. I mean, that can help you out there because now you're getting real time um, information on what you have if you project this job out um, over those 260 some days. Are you, are, are you going to be okay? And then, so being efficient and accurate in your cost estimating, figuring out how much it costs you to do, not, not how much you're charging, but how much it's costing you to do, and then tracking, reporting, and controlling that information of cost, that, that's crucial to a construction contractor. Because we're all, you know I mean? We're all trying to deliver the same thing, but the one who can do it and, and have competitive costs that are the same or lower than their competition, in kind of a continuous, you know, improvement type way. That's kind of the way that that you stay viable and you know successful is managing and controlling those costs, and then revisiting them when you bid a future job to to make sure that you're looking at past performance to know how you do in a certain area, if there's room for improvement or what have you. All right. So, so the items consider, you know, when you're when you're doing the go no go, your current workload. Um, what types of risk are you going you know, to have with this project, like with the real versus the liquidated damages? Do you have the staff and equipment to do it at the time you need? Do you have the bonding capacity and, and, and do you satisfy the insurance requirements? You know, do you have an edge on the project? Is there some unique innovative way that you do it that's gonna keep your cost down for the paving aspects or for you know, something else associated with that? Um, how many bidders are there? There's a ton of bidders, man. That, that can be tough. That's just more opportunity for somebody to make a mistake and be the low bid guy. You know what I mean? So, you know, that's that's just something to consider there. So next, I would like to um, jump into the, the uh, next aspect, which is the uh, talking about the office overhead, which are the costs that are not necessarily part of the actual work, you know, putting work in place, uh, but they're responsible just to be, you know, a viable business. So it's the rent or depreciation on your office space, the utilities for, for that space, you know, non-project charge staff, you know, maybe internal accountants or payroll or, or legal um, executives. And then um, the expected cost to pay project staff, you know, but you know, between projects, you don't want to lay people off. So you need to have enough money in there to, to carry your staff for a whole year, whatever the case may be. Um, different supplies and furniture, automobile costs, you know, um, you know, repair of items for your office maintenance. So it, in general, it's just any costs that are that are not directly charged to the job is kind of the, you know, the office overhead. And these are just like rules of thumb. This is not set in stone. This could vary. These are just examples. So basically what you want to do, figure out where all your items are, you know, that's associated with your office overhead. Hard part is, you know, finding which percentage that you want to add, you know, to the project. It could be trial and error based on, you know, based on the market that you're in. And, and so basically it's a term about coming up with your projection of the new year's work. You know, what do you expect to get over the course of a year in terms of revenue, money coming in? And at the end of the day, it's just a prediction. I mean, it's just an educated, educated guess. So I'm going to pull up an example spreadsheet here to kind of look at, to try to tie some of these, you know, concepts together. Um, and again, I can make this spreadsheet available. So with, with this one, we just have a um, worksheet that we have as a percentage of, of the main office overhead. I've just went through here and listed a bunch of items here. Um, and, that, and the 15 ETC is et cetera. You can add to it, you know, whatever you need. Then I put 
um, some amounts per month that we have here. And then I just did the total for the year. Point being is these are all costs that you're gonna incur over the course of a year that you need to, to try to figure out how you're gonna recoup on each project or each opportunity is a way that you have to try to apply some of this cost to so that you can basically reimburse yourself for these things. That's just one way to look at it. So in our example here, just office rent power, sum that up, $491,400. And we're projecting our volume for the next year is gonna be 30 million. So if we do the math here, then that means that for each dollar in that 30 million or each project in that 30 million, um, in order to break even, we have to get 1.64% as our percentage to uh, recover that. So this is just a simple example here of how to deal with main office overhead and how that has to be applied towards each you know, project in this revenue stream here to kind of get compensated for it. All right. So jumping back to the presentation there. So that's an example for that one. Next, you have like, you know, project overhead. Again, it's, it's project related, but it's not directly putting the work in place. It's not directly putting that striping down or pouring that concrete. So, uh, so basically it, it's what you need to run the project or manage the project. And it's not a direct cost required for each item. And so for instance, you might have a superintendent or, you know, your supervisor a trailer if you need it, utilities for that trailer, some equipment that can't be in one item like hoisting, you know, or um, a broom, you know, uh, attachment that you have to kind of clean up the parking lot or something uh, to do the schedules for the job. And just, there's a variety of other items that you could have there, submittal, so on and so forth. Those are all things that you, that, that we include in that. And so again, you want to apply that percentage um, as a result of the whole bid item. We'll, we'll get into that, to that example here. So I'll jump back into that spreadsheet right here. And we'll click over to this next tab, which is the project overhead. And for this one, you know, we list some of those things where we have, you know, a superintendent, assistant superintendent. This is one of those checklist opportunities where if you kind of use something like this and you put you know, everything that you could reasonably have or a good list of what you had in the past, keep it there. If you don't need it, then you just put zero there. I'll zoom in on a little, just a little bit, make sure everybody can see it. Um, so basically, you know, for this particular project, this is just, just an example, for, but for this particular project, you might need a superintendent for two months. And that's what their unit cost is to, to compensate them for, for, you know, for the labor. You might have some equipment that they need, like $400 a month for their truck. You might want to allocate that to this project. And again, this is just, these are just suggestions. This is just an example. And so what you do is you, know, you get their labor for two months at that rate, and then their equipment for two months at that rate, and you get that total. So once you figure out all of the different project overhead items that you're gonna to need to get this done, water, tip, fence, toilets, you say how long you're gonna need it, what the unit rate is, and then you sum it up here. And so basically, once you get the, um, the uh, grand total here, that's how, just like we did for the company overhead, that's how much project overhead needs to get spread out across the bid item. And we'll, we'll talk about that in, in just a little bit. So that amount you need to spread across all the bid items that you have for the particular project that you're looking at. In the case of the Port of Seattle will be all those bid items. You spread it out across there so that you can recoup it. Now, there's a lot of strategy that goes in that. You just don't want to blindly do that. But just for, 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 just for sake of an example, um, that's um, just a generic approach to it. All right, so let's jump back over here. To this presentation. So now I'm just going to have a, we're going to talk about uh, profit. Profit is payment for the risk and the return on investment that you make. Uh, how do you decide what the profit should be? So this is just one approach. There's many approaches. This is just one. So if it's something that's, you know, on the low range of the risk spectrum or whatever it is, then it's 10 to 15%. If it's on the high range, 
25 or 30%. So you want to consider the items that we have below the need, the risk, the size in the marketplace, and you want to assign a profit percent for each. And then you sum up all of those percentages and you divide it by four because we have four items, need, risk, size, and marketplace. And then that's the average profit that you apply to the cost estimate. This is just, I'm just using this as an example so that people can kind of see it. It's typically not just a generic, oh, I want 20%. You know, there's, there's a little bit of, a little bit more thought that you can put into it that there might be something unique to this project that you want to capture to make sure that you're getting um, compensated for that risk associated with this project. So the need is, how bad do you need the job? You got the low range, the high range. Um, risk, is it, it, it if, if it's risky on the high side, you know, the more you're going to want, if it's not, the less. The size of relationship to what you normally do, you know, that's, that's kind of a factor there. If it's right in the wheelhouse, you know, it's kind of on the lower side. If you're kind of reaching out a little bit, you might want to go up on the higher side. Marketplace, what would a market, you know, bear? Um, this is kind of an adjustment that you could make based on how tight or how competitive the market is. And so here's, here's an example. Um, we're saying need, we're giving that 10%. It's on the lower range. We're saying it's kind of high risk. It's on the high range, 30%. Size, that's eh, 50%, just slightly above what we're used to doing. Um, marketplace, 25%. Um, and then you sum all that up to 80%, you divide it by four and you get 20%. So that, that's what you, what you would apply as the profit for this particular project. So now let's go ahead and look at all parts of the bid item, you know, just using our example there. So we'll look at, you know, material cost per unit, labor cost per unit, equipment cost per unit, subcontractor cost per unit, and then the percentage of the general conditions and profit Per the unit cost, and then a percentage of the you know the project general conditions per unit cost, and then also any bonds or insurance that we have uh, specific to this project. So let's jump back into that spreadsheet. So now we're going to go to we're going to go to our 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 bare unit unit cost. I'll blow this up a touch. Get it all in there. So basically, this is just an example project. It's, it's a paving project that we have. I'm not making this relevant to that active project. Um, that was just something that we kind of brought up to kind of go through because that's actively going. Uh, I don't want to do anything that might influence or something or confuse. So I'm saying this is a normal paving project where we're going to have to take out some existing pavement, reestablish it, get it nice and level, maybe cement trees to base, cement treat the base a little bit because it's not, you know, the best materials in the world, but we can still cement treat it and make it work. And then it's going to, we're going to have some concrete paving. Then we're going to have to replace some guardrail. And then finally, we're going to make it look nice and have some striping. So these are all of our work items, items of work here. So for the cut, we want to look at, you know, all of the material, labor, sub, whatever we have here. Um, so for this one, we got you know, from our bid item that it's 1500 cubic yards. And we're estimating it's gonna take us 10 days with a moto grader as far as equipment to be able to do that cut. And it's $750. And then over 10 days, that's $7,500. So as a part of this cut item, we got, in order to do the cut, we got the grader there. And so we just put it in what we think it's gonna take. Same thing with the dozer operators, laborers, and so forth. Um, this is what we have here, the hours, and then the unit labor for the hours. And then here's the sum of it here. And then this is what in total we think it's gonna take. And then for this one, we have our labor burden of 30%. And this, this is just an example. This will be something that's you know unique to how you do it, but you wanna make sure that you get that labor burden in there to cover any benefits and so on and so forth. And, and this, this could change or vary. This is just an example. And so basically what that does is that gets us our, our cost there, our bare cost for the uh, cut item. And then we go, same thing, we go to the, uh, to the, to the fill, um, and then on to the, to the cement treated base, where the cement treated base, that's nothing that we self-perform. So we went out 
and we got a sub number for that. So a sub, you know, basically told us that for the 1800 square yards that that is called out on the bid item for five dollars a square yard, they'll come in and do that cement treated base for us. And so that gives us, you know, a total of nine thousand dollars that we're going to have to pay that sub for the item of work associated with cement treated base. And you do the same thing for the paving and for the guardrail and for the striping. So if you notice here, um, these this this holds your quantities. In this column, it holds the units. And then here you get into whether it's labor, material, equipment. And then you get, you know, you and then you do the math here and you start summing it up to get your cost. So this right here, these right here are items of cost. Now this is just cost. And the labor burden is, is cost that, you know, employer related payroll tax, whatever it is that you have in there, that's all cost. That's what it's costing you to perform this 1500 cubic yards of cut. All right, so now that we get all of our costs together, now we wanna go and start pricing these things and applying the percentages that we just talked about. All right, so this is kind of the, the last step in the process. So this is our final, our final cost sheet where we take our cost and we apply the percentages to get our unit rates for each of these unit items that we just did our that we just use, that we just went over the estimate that we used for this example. So here you have your total bare cost. This is this just comes straight from this bare cost worksheet here. This twenty six thousand one ninety two is all of the cost that you have for that cut. That's all that's being summed there. Now these are all of your markups or what you need to add to that to, to arrive at your final price or what you're going to give as your final unit unit rate to the client or you're gonna put in that bid form that we looked at for the Port of Seattle, just as an example. So here we're considering we got bond, insurance, general conditions or overhead, and then um, profit here. And then uh, here's your, you know, your total. And then this will get you, you know, your final unit cost. So something that I have set up in this spreadsheet is when you sum it up like this, I'm basically having a sum that includes all of these calculations against the bare unit cost. When you get this spreadsheet, depending on how you have Excel set up, you may have to allow for something called an iterative calculation. So you just go to, and you can email me this and I'll, I'll send you the instructions. So you go to file and options. When you go to options, you go to formulas and you wanna make sure that this enable iterative calculation checkbox is on. So that'll allow you to do that. So this is just one of the times where you just, you, you typically people won't have this checked on, but in order to make this particular spreadsheet work a little bit more cleaner and convenient, you have to enable this iterative calculation. So that basically allows you um, to get away with some of all these things, doing these calculations and relying on this as your total. So anyway, I don't wanna get too far down to that so what we have here is, you know, the bond for this job, you get that from your bonding producer, it's two and a half percent. So what you're doing is you're multiplying, you know, your total bond by what your, you know, your total cost is for this particular item of a cut. And you do the same thing for the insurance and then for the um, general conditions, um, you apply that same percentage. And then for this one, you apply your, um, your um, profit here of 11.67%. And then you multiply it and, and then you sum up all of these percentages based on your bare unit cost and that'll give you your total. So this is your total cost plus all of these markups. And then to get the unit rate, all, all you have to do is divide that total cost by the 1500 cubic yards and that gets you $26.57 per cubic yard is what you're going to put in that proposal form to uh, charge the client for this particular job. So again, this is just a, you know, a simple example um, to kind of illustrate, you know, those uh, concepts there. So that's all I have. Um, so if there are any uh, questions, um, please let me know. Tamak, I see you've joined us. Do you have any um, comments about the presentation or Port of Seattle procurement opportunities? Hi. 
Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm sorry I was late. I had another call. Um, great presentation, Alan. Thank you so very much. Um, and as Alan uh, stated, um, the project he was going over is active. So if you are interested in it, um, you are to go to Vendor Connect. Um, right now, we will have the pre-bid meeting is scheduled for December the 14th. So if you are interested, Vendor Connect, and you can attend the pre-bid meeting, which is on December the 14th. Um, if you go to Vendor Connect, it has all the instructions on how to attend the pre-bid meeting, ask any questions, um, because right now there, um, we do have question um, that's open. So if you have a specific question related to the project, project manager and or myself on the DBE side, can answer those questions at this time. Um, in general, um, everything Alan said is on point um, for the Port of Seattle, whether it's an um, airport um, paid project or FAA, is critical for you to ensure that you read the specs. Um, make sure you read all bid documents, especially um, what is required at bid time, that's crucial. And again, just make sure you pay attention to some of the, uh, as I call them, nuances. You know, what are their special requirements, um, special documents, uh, pay attention to dates. All of that information um, is important, especially as you put together um, your estimate and your bid. So um, that's some key points that I think you should uh, pay attention to. And again, um, Alan, great presentation. Alrighty, thank you. Thank you, Alan. That was great presentation.